بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأخدة من لساني يفقى قولي The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله عليه وسلم He went from calamity to calamity from the boycott no business transaction no family interaction no marriages to take place to seeing his uncle passing away to his beloved wife the love of his life has passed away he at such a low point in life yes or no very low point in life what will the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam do and that's a lesson right from the get go of this session a lesson for all of us regardless of the level you may come from of faith education and so on the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam realized that the message of Islam is about to come to a stop, yes or no, in terms of obstacles are coming. So the Prophet, is he going to settle? No, the Prophet is going to go ask for help. And there's nothing wrong to ask for help when you need it. Are you guys with me? There's nothing wrong with, ask, with asking for help when you what? When you need it. If the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who has Jibreel come to him, he's still going to go ask people for help. Should you and I, in severe hardships, when we are in need, not ask the people, yes or no? So don't be shy, there's a doubtful matter in Islam, you're on the verge of whatever, struggling with your faith, to things of that sort, you're incapable of finding the answer, you are in need, go and ask. Are you guys with me? May Allah grant you all ease, Amir Rabbil Alameen. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Abu Talib passed away, brothers and sister, sisters, the persecution, what, escalated. Let me give you just one example, one occasion. Now, who died? Abu Talib. So the doors, to an extent, are open for more persecution. So the people of Quraysh, they were gathered. The leaders amongst them. And they said, enough and enough with this man, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He has been disrespecting our idols. He's been causing chaos. Enough is enough. We have to put an end to this. So what happens? As they were talking, who walks? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They all got up and they surrounded the Prophet sallallahu And they said, so, are you the one who talks about our idols in a negative way, such as, they don't benefit these rocks and they don't cause harm and they're just something man-made. Did you say that? So the Prophet says, Naam, ana aqulu dhalik. Yes, I'm, I'm, I do say that. Then they all jumped him and they start to punch him, physically abuse him from a kick to a punch until one person came with a cloth, a garment, and put it around the Prophet wasallam. And this is the worst story of his entire life in Mecca. Are you guys with me? They go with that garment around the Prophet's neck. They're choking him. They're choking him. They're choking him. The Prophet is on the verge of dying. He can't breathe. He can't breathe. People yelled out loud to who? To the Prophet's best friend. Come to the rescue. Ya Abu Bakr. Ya Abu Bakr. What happened? Sahibu, go help your friend. Abu Bakr ran and ran so fast. He was crying, crying. He says, rajulan. You kill a man because he says, La ilaha illallah. You want to end his life because he believes in one God. When he came, the people asked, Who is this guy? They said, Abu Bakr al Majnoon. This is the insane idiot, Abu Bakr. So they let go of the Prophet. The Prophet, in one narration, he fainted. Then, فَوَثَبُوا عَلَىٰ أَبُو بَكْرِ They jumped Abu Bakr. They kept punching him, kicking him. It's so bad. The narration says, are you guys with me? Just to indicate how bad it was. They hit him so hard. They pulled his hair till he lost his hair. Whenever he used to walk after that day, do, does this, all the hair is gone. That's the beating he received. But once again, once again, don't lay a finger on the Prophet ﷺ. We'll do whatever we can, whatever possible. If I have the status to help out, I will help out. You know it's got really bad now, yes or no? This is, this, is, this is a matter of days, months, till it gets worse and worse. Brothers and sisters, Muhammad Sallallahu is gonna go seek help. And where is he gonna go? He's gonna go to a city nearby. And this city is called at taif And please pay attention. May Allah grant you all Jannah, say Ameen. Mecca, had it been here, at taif is a southeast or so to Mecca. How far is it? For the brothers and sisters watching from the UK and other places, it's about 90 kilometers, all right? Approximately. And for us here with miles, it's about 55 miles approximately. 
Rasulullah who will be traveling, will Allah send the angel on the wing of the angel? No, no, not even close. Will he ride a camel? No, he will go by foot. Why? As secret as it looks like. Not to have luggage and indicate that I'm trying to go to a ta'if seeking help. That will be like treason. That will be like you want to go collaborate with someone else to fight us. And you know Quraysh will make up whatever it takes, right? They'll make up a story. So the Prophet walks day after day, struggle after struggle, under the heat of the sun. Of, I want you to appreciate it. I want to give a little bit of these details to appreciate as much as we can. So now, when I say under the heat of the sun of Arabia, on the very hot burning sands of Arabia, the reflection of the sun from the sand can blind the person, yes or no? When you increase your brightness, when you increase your brightness on your phone, does the phone not give you a warning sign? Brightness may damage your eyes, yes or no? For a minute or two, they warn you. The Prophet is going to go for about 55 miles. You're going almost flint or so. May Allah protect us, say I mean, On foot, struggling. You appreciate that wonderful man. Why? For you to be able to say, La ilaha illallah in this city. For you to be able to die as a believer because he wants to fulfill the command of Allah. When he became a prophet, the day one of being a messenger, Allah told him, Qum fa'andhir, stand up and preach. Yes or no? Stand up and warn the people. And wallahi, he stood up on that day and he never rested or took a day off. In terms of da'wah, worship of Allah. May Allah grant us all jannah. Say ameen. So the prophet kept going, struggling, thirsty, hungry, no, no luggages, had to struggle. The moment he arrived, brothers and sisters, to at taif he went to at taif and there were three leaders. And who were they? They were the leaders of at taif They were all three brothers. For example, Abdi Yalayl and other of his brothers. So he came and look what he told him. You guys with me? Number one, he obviously explained himself. This is just a given. Then he told them about Islam, which I've given you so many points about it before. I will not reiterate what Islam is about. Fair enough? He told them about Islam. And then he told them what he wants. I'm looking for a group of people. Would you guys mind supporting me, protecting me? I want to seek refuge in your city. And the Prophet, when he says that stuff, he usually follows up with what? Usually. And I guarantee you we will be successful. Yes or no? And that guarantee is only to them or also to us? It's also to us. Yes or no? Did Allah not say, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا did Allah not say the one who are God conscious, Allah will always have an exit for you? Did Allah not say that those who believe and do righteous deeds will go to Jannah? Yes or no? The promise is the same, but the hearts may be different. May Allah grant the sincerity. Say Ameen. So they said that, or he said that to the leaders of Al-Ta'if. What's number one? What Islam is all about. What's number two? What I want from you, protection. I live amongst you for you to protect me. And inshallah, things will be wonderful after that. Now, who's, who's speaking? Who's the one speaking? A Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But on, why am I stressing on this? The wisest speaker, yes? The most eloquent speaker. The highest caliber of a human being ever walked on earth, correct? What have they responded? And I want to give you a quick background. Leaders of Al-Ta'if and leaders of Quraysh, they know it's the truth, yes or no? Many of them, they know it's the truth, agreed? And Allah documents in the Quran that they said... The disbelievers said, focus with me. They said, out of jealousy, why did God not reveal the message to me as the leader? Are you guys with me? That's why they're so upset. Why did God choose him? There are people of higher status in society. That's a verse. So even though they recognize the message, and you have to appreciate something. You remember when we spoke about the people of the elephant? Oh, before the Prophet was born, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Remember how the people were so jealous of how people used to come to the Kaaba, circulate around it. It was an international religious capital. Remember that? Then God sent birds to destroy the soldiers that came with their elephants to destroy the Kaaba. Remember that? What was the lessons extracted? Allah chooses whoever He wants. So the people, when they wanted to destroy the Kaaba, they were jealous. Why people love to go to Mecca and not love to come to us? So the lesson has been established from not day one, from minus 50 days from the Prophet's birth, وسلم, approximately. That I choose whatever I, whoever I want. And I bless whoever I want. 
So don't be jealous of someone who was born into a rich family when you were born into a poor family. Allah established that from before the Prophet became a Prophet. And even the disbelievers, they saw that with their own eyes, yes or no? Birds coming and destroying that. And now the point comes again. You guys, your parents told you, you even perhaps lived long enough to see the army of the elephants being destroyed. And you saw how Allah preferred you as Arab around Mecca over others that you have the Kaaba, yes? So now you complain and you do what the army of the elephants are doing. Why him and why not me? You guys got the summary right here. So then when the Prophet presented Islam, look at the responses that he got. Number one, someone of the leaders, one of them says, could God not find someone better than you? This is being said to the greatest man that ever walked on earth. May Allah grant us all Jannah say Ameen. I walk in here, it takes me about a good 20 seconds, and that's because I'm going fast. Why? Saying salam, brother, appreciate you guys doing this, doing this lecture for us, right? Brother Zakal here, brother Majid, we appreciate, right? That's the respect we get. And I'm a nobody, nobody, nobody compared to Prophet Muhammad, yes or no? So the greatest of da'is, scholars to Allah, and speaking to these people, and they tell him, could Allah not find someone better than you? How would you react right now if someone stood up and says, you're a horrible speaker? Even if I was, and you believed I was, you still see that disrespectful. Then what if that was said to your Prophet ﷺ? Are you guys with me? When I say stuff like that, you know why? Because you will see how the Prophet will react. And the next time you get a criticism, the next time someone wants to put, kick you down or whatever the case may be, you realize the Prophet saw worse than that and he remained standing. So you and I should not, should, should, shall not fall from one negative critique that is false especially. May Allah protect us. Could Allah not find someone better than you? The other brother said, I would rip the cloth of the Kaaba if God sent you. What does that mean? If God sent you, I'm going to disbelieve in God and the whole thing. It makes no sense. Why you? The third one said, listen, I swear I'm not going to talk to you. Why? Either I am not worth your time because you're a prophet, busy guy. Or you're not worth my time because you're a liar. 55 plus miles on feet, hungry, thirsty. That's, he, he, possibly I will get a no, but that level... So the Prophet stood up, waqaf al nabi and he felt a bit hopeless towards them. Not towards God, a'udhu billah. He felt, I'm not going to go further and try, like what if I, no, 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 that's it. He says, I have one last request. He is expecting these people, the three of them, have an ounce of mercy left. So he's addressing the ounce of mercy in their hearts, had they have hearts. If you don't accept, la bas, no problem. But I beg you, I ask you, do not go notify Quraysh that I came to you. Make sense? Just don't do that. They stood up and they went outside whatever tent or area and he, they called out the leader. Guys, this Muhammad guy came over here and the people are waiting. If the leader says go, thumbs up, they all believe. Are you guys with me? That's how things worked. Go. Huh? And follow. He says, insult him. Make him a disgrace. Make him a lesson for those that don't take lessons. Make an example out of him. The people gathered around the Prophet. What is this? Youngsters, elders, the weak and the wicked and the strong came. Start talking trash. You're such and such. Criticize his family. Criticize his spouse. Criticize his kids. You're nothing. You're a loser. Start picking stuff and throwing at him. Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad goes through that. Muhammad goes through that. And the Prophet start running, and they ran after him. He's running. He's about 50 some years old. Running, throwing you this and that. The, wor the worst words, your dic dictionary, wherever. May Allah protect us. May Allah grant us pure tongues. Say I mean. They threw that at your Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You're this and you're that. Throwing stuff at him. And he was struggling. And they ran after him. For how long? A mile? They kept running after him. And the Prophet was running, throwing stuff at him until he saw like a backyard, a wall to a garden. And he jumped on, on top of that wall and went to like someone else's backyard. And he was devastated. It just could not get any worse. This is by far, now with the, the extreme examples of a ta'if, overcomes or overrules all the pain that he saw. He sits in the garden, and I'm not sitting just to imitate here, 
But the Prophet ﷺ sitting devastated. And then the Prophet ﷺ, what will he do? What will he do? What would some people do? They get angry at God, yes or no? Some people will be very upset. Why would he do that to me? Why? How does that even make sense? I did this, I'm trying to spread your message. Okay, I can get a rejection, I don't mind, but not in that way. 50 plus years old, talking trash about my wife and my kids and my honor and my dignity and when I assassinate my character. No, Audhu Billah, the Prophet doesn't say that. Brothers and sisters, when you have no one around you and all those who supported you are gone, the Prophet's wife Khadija is gone, Abu Talib is gone, all the people are gone, it's a sign for you to realize you have no one else to 100% rel rely on except Allah. Are you guys with me? When someone who's divorced and people neglect that person, speak ill of that person, it's a sign you have none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're someone who has been fired from your job because you're practicing your faith, it comes to tell you you have no one but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the guy who promised you a job at his company is no longer part of that company, it's for you to know that only Allah provides. Allahu Akbar. And that's how the Prophet ﷺ viewed it. And the first thing the Prophet ﷺ will do is what? Pray to Allah the Creator. Allahu Akbar. Pray. And he made his prayers and made the very famous dua in which the Prophet ﷺ, what did he say? He said, Allahumma inni ashku ilayka da'af quwwati. Oh Allah, I complain to you. Look at the dua. Oh Allah, I complain to you about my weakness. I am so weak. Wa qilla and I have no means. And the people are disrespecting me. I have no value in the eyes of people. I'm nothing in the eyes of people. Ya Allah, to whom are you handing my affairs to? To a far away enemy who is going to attack me? Or for a close relative who has control over me? Ya Allah, my main concern is this. You are the most merciful. Anta arhamur rahimin. If you are not angry at me, then I can endure all of that pain. Ya Allah, my ultimate concern is this. Are you angry at me? Are these signs that you're dissatisfied with me? If they were not, I will suffer all the suffering. I will endure all of that, but I cannot endure. I cannot handle a moment when you're angry at me. Allahu Akbar. Then he says, however Allah, I would very much appreciate ease, afiyah. I would very much appreciate if things can be eased, ya Allah. Then he says, O oh Allah, a'udhu bi nuri wajhik. I seek refuge in the light that is glowing from your beautiful face. I seek refuge in the light from your face that illuminates all darkness. I seek refuge in the light of your face that fixes all the affairs of the world. I seek refuge in you from ever facing your anger and from ever having you displeased with me. I will continue to work. I will continue to work. I will continue to work. I will repent back to you. I will continue glorifying you until I reach my ultimate goal, until you are pleased with me. And Ya Allah, you are the source of power. Without you, I'm powerless. Ya Allah, I need you in my life. I cannot live without you. Instead of being angry at Allah, he is worried if Allah is angry at him. Sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet is sitting in the garden under a tree. This garden, guess who owns it? Two people who hate the Prophet. <laughs> Ibn Rabi'ah. Ibn Rabi'ah, the two children of Rabi'ah, they saw the Prophet, they, they hated him. His, their father hates the Prophet more than you can imagine. He is part of the team that persecutes the Prophet. But you know what happened? Wallahi, if the only thing I can describe of how bad the Prophet's situation, if I have like a sentence to say, it would be the following one. Ibn Rabi'ah felt bad for the Prophet. Are you guys with me? They want him to get killed, but when they saw him in such misery, dirt, some even say perhaps blood, they felt bad. Like when your enemy feels bad for you, that, that's, something really bad happened. So they told their servant, Adas, Adas, listen, grab these grapes. It was a garden of grapes. Grab these grapes and then put it into that plate and give it to that man over there and tell him to eat. 
At that, the servant listened, grabbed the grapes, put it into a plate, went to the Muhammad وسلم, and he says, Kul, eat. So the Prophet وسلم, starving. Wallahi, his situation, Wallahi, makes the heart broken, yes or no? So he extends his hand, grabs a grape, and the first thing he says was, Bismillah. Because remember, it's Allah's, the one who helping you chew. It's Allah who's helping you digest your food. And Allah will do that even if you disbelieve in Him. That's how merciful He is. To the ones who love Allah and to the ones who don't like Allah. But He said, with Allah's assistance, I will be able to eat. He just said it. Allah, you're the source of what? Power. Without you, I am what? Powerless. And you see Him walking the talk. Yes or no? Bismillah. May Allah allow you all to remember, including myself and my family, to say Bismillah before we eat and drink. So when Adas heard that, he said, Bismillah. No one says that here. He's a young boy. He's like, no one in this part of the world ever says Bismillah. So the Prophet says, yeah, the Prophet, do you have the energy to explain and help someone? Or, and it, this boy is going to help you find a tribe. I was like, okay, khalas, you know what, just move on. No. He says, and which part of the world are you from? And what's your religion? He says, I am from Ninawa. I think in English, Nineveh. I think. Ninawa is a city in Iraq. That's where he's from. And I pray to Allah to bless all our brothers and sisters in Iraq. Wallahi bless them simply for what Adas is about to do. You guys check it out. So Adas says, I am from where? Ninawa, from Iraq. And I'm a Christian. The Prophet says, Ninawa, oh, that city. This is the city of the righteous man, Yunus ibn Matta. Yunus, the son of Matta. Adas was like, and how do you know him? Now that's a double, like you said, Bismillah, I got that. You know Yunus? That was like a long time ago. How do you know history like that? He says, he's my brother. He was a prophet, and I'm a prophet. And the Prophet said, said stuff that only prophets know. Are you guys with me? The Prophet said stuff and only prophets can know. And this young man was a well-educated person in religion. Now who's watching this whole thing? Allah. Ibn Rabi'ah. And Allah's watching, Ibn Rabi'ah, right? So they're watching. And all of a sudden, guess what they see? Adas kisses the forehead of the Prophet ﷺ. Adas kisses the hands of the Prophet ﷺ. Adas goes to the ground kissing the feet of the Prophet ﷺ. Ibn Rabi'ah was like, Afsad alayka ghulamak. This guy ruined our servant. He ruined them. So then Adas comes. And then they said, Ya Adas, we told you to give him grapes. <laughs> what in the world did you do? What is wrong with you kissing his forehead, kissing his hands, kissing his feet? Alama, what's, what's going on? He said to them, Wallahi, I swear to God, there's nothing on earth, there's no human being on earth more honorable than this man, Muhammad Sallallahu They said, Ya Adas, <laughs> Don't let him take you away from your religion. Your religion is far better than his. But Adas saw the truth. And there's a truth in your heart that you're born with. And when the light in the heart sees the light from revelation and it comes beautifully together, it will never let go. May Allah keep us strong. This is what happened, brother and sister, in the garden when Prophet Sallam prayed to Allah and he saw this from Adas and the grapes were given to him. He's like, that's the only thing that came out of the strip? Don't belittle that. Yes or no? The Prophet teaches us that yes, it's a young man, a young boy who can't even help me much. But even him, I'll put the energy to tell him about the truth. Because once again, he's mercy to all beings, whether from Mecca, whether from Saudi Arabia today, wala Iraq, wala Egypt, wala Somal, wala anywhere part of the world, the Prophet is mercy to all beings. And he illustrates that in his life, yes or no? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then brothers and sisters, as the Prophet sallam, was walking, devastated, so much in pain, and the sun was above his head, all of a sudden, he gets shaded. So he looks up. Imagine, you're, you know how it happens? Sometimes you're walking and shade comes. Like, what cloud is that? So he looked up. Who was it? It was Angel Jibreel, alayhi salam. Angel Jibreel, brothers and sisters, he comes and look to what he says. He says, Ya Muhammad, Allah has heard what the people did to you and Allah has saw what the people have done to you. Allahu Akbar, I have to stop. Whatever in the world you go through, there is no surveillance, there's no witnesses, no Allah from seven heavens have it documented. Are you guys with me? If you don't get your rights in this world, I swear by the one who made you, you'll get it in the afterlife. Fair enough? 
So always keep in mind, Allah is watching, Allah is seeing. And Jibreel is reminding the Prophet ﷺ. Allah was aware of every step. You may say, why didn't Allah do something about it? You don't ask Allah why, He asks you why. Proceed, proceed. Hey, o Muhammad, and Allah allowed me to come here with me is the angel, another angel who is responsible for the mountains. And tell him whatever you want him to do. The angel of the mountains, he comes. He says, Ya Muhammad, I'm the angel of the mountains. Allah sent me to you. Allah saw what the people did to you and what the people said to you. Tell me whatever you want me to do with the mountains and I will do as you wish. And you can tell the angel is very angry. He says, and if you want, I can get the two mountains and crush them for you. Just say whatever you want. So the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ, if he has an ounce of revenge to humanity, he would use it now. Yes or no? All bloody, all in pain. Brothers and sisters, when people get into a fight, huh? People get into a fight. What happens when clips that you watch and movies and stuff, when the guy gets punched, what does he do usually? Right? Checks if there's blood. And there's blood, what happens? Takes off that jacket and full fight. Yes or no? So the Prophet is full of pain. So if there's any time at a weak point, imagine a weak point, the weakest point in your life, and you're given a full card, do whatever you want with these people who made you that pain, who caused you that pain. Whatever you ask for, it's justified. Say whatever you want. So the Prophet says, La, no, 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 no. Don't crush the people, no. They, they tried to crush you, but I will not crush them back. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. He says, if they do not believe, then I'm optimistic and I pray and I hope. If these men and women don't believe, then their children perhaps will believe. Then their grandchildren will eventually believe and their great-grandchildren will soon believe. Inshallah, I'm optimistic. No, don't end the whole society. Brothers and sisters, let me jump forward 1400 years later. How is Al-Ta'af doing today? How is Al-Ta'af doing today? Masjid in every corner. Allah is being glorified. Masajid Adhan, Adhan is being called an Al-Ta'if today. Ashhadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. They would have been done, they would have never existed if it was not for the Rahmah of Allah and then the Rahmah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He goes with me. He said, no. And wallah, if he did say do it, no one would criticize him because he got so much pain, but that's who he was, greatness upon greatness. Because you have to realize when Islam came to you, it did not come on a golden platter. Here you go, Islam came to you with a platter that is cracked, platter, blood, platter, souls left the bodies, and that's how it came to you. So you have to appreciate, don't take it for granted. Don't walk into Dearborn and other cities like, we got this message, you have to know how this message came about. You have to know the source, the one who spread the message, how he struggled. And you have to love him more than anything. Are you guys with me? That is why when the Prophet tells you, your faith is incomplete until you love me, more than you love yourself. Yes or no? Why? Wallahi. He did not say that to us, except that he knows that loving him will benefit us. Are you guys with me? He did not say that, except because loving him more than ourselves will benefit us. It's not for him. He was not about the I, the me. It was not about him. He never sought revenge for personal reasons. Never. But when Allah is being disrespected, yes, he got angry. When the religion is being stepped on, yes, he gets upset. He uses the energy to clarify the matters. Are you guys with me? May Allah grant us Jannah and grant us wisdom. Brothers and sisters, he wants to go back to Mecca. And Mecca is very tense now, right? About 10 days he's gone. It's a trip. What will he do? The Rajah, the majority of the opinion, the strongest available suggested that when the Prophet ﷺ is approaching Mecca, he sought someone to give him shelter, like to say, you know what, I, I got you. But it has to be from the leadership, not from the weak people. Are you guys with me? So when he kept asking, Mut'am bin Aday, if I hopefully pronounce the name correctly, he says, I will take care of the Prophet, he will be under my wing, as protection. And the Arab honored that. If you are under his protection, it's okay. But as long as you're protecting him, not because you followed him as a belief. Subhanallah, you see that? So Mut'am asked his kids, Wear your body armor, get your swords, get your weapons, surround Muhammad and make sure he goes back home safely. People saw that, respected his decision, especially that it was not out of belief. It was out of what? Prestige or out of kindness or out of whatever you want to call it. Fair enough. He walked into his house. One night, brothers and sisters, very devastating. 
chaos situations took place. But one night, as he was resting, the ceiling above him split open. Be patient on a clarifying. The ceiling opened up. And the angel came, Jibreel السلام, and cut the chest of the Prophet. He took out the heart of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then he brought a bucket of water, Zamzam, filled with wisdom and faith. Filled with what? Iman wa hikmah, wisdom and faith. Washed the heart with Zamzam, washed the heart with wisdom and faith, and placed and injected it into the heart, placed it back into the body of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and stitched it back. Okay, good luck. <laughs> All right. May Allah grant us ease in explaining the following. Say, say Ameen. May Allah bless the following. Ameen. Before I proceed, because this journey was mainly, we will benefit, but it was mainly for the Prophet ﷺ. Are you guys with me? And now you will hear things that may, may collide with your intellect. So what I want to spend a few minutes on right now, and it's going to be a bit heavy duty, but inshallah, it's to me, but you'll be easy, inshallah. How to reconcile between the intellect, your logic, your experience in life, the books from school. How do you reconcile the intellect with what? With revelation. Quran, an authentic, prophetic narration. Are you guys with me? How do we reconcile the intellect and what? Revelation. One last time. Intellect and revelation. Some people, when they pr pr preach it, they tell you the intellect is to be on lockdown, yes? Don't use it. Whatever revelation, it's it, that's it, right? It might come in a wrong way. What Islam teaches us, and I'm using Dr. Sheikh Tarefi's response to that, the revelation and the intellect need one another. Let me rephrase that. They support one another. They what? Support one another. So, the stronger your intellect is, and the more revelation you believe in and practice, the clearer is your way in this life and afterlife. So you need both. You need what? Both. Think of it as the intellect as your sight. Your what? Sight. Revelation as light. If you had the best sight in the world, but there is no light, can you walk? No. no. And, and, if you had all the light in the world, all the revelation, but you had no sight, would you be able to walk? No. That is an example of someone who has no sight, what did I mean, has no what? Intellect. Will Allah hold them accountable on the day of judgment? No, He will not. In the sense of why didn't you do this, why didn't you do that? Are you guys with me? Because there's no intellect. So as Islam teaches you, you need intellect and you need revelation. So therefore, if you have vision, 2020 vision, and you had sunlight, you will walk and you know your way very well. Then imagine an intellect, like the one Allah gifted you with, combined with light from Allah, how great will your life be? Fair enough? So, if you wish to headbutt revelation and be arrogant and not submit to it, you'll be in trouble. See, it will happen. Maybe a few times in life, it may happen. Revelation says this, but my books and my... Uh, it collides. Is it authentic revelation? Yes, it's authentic. Is that clear-cut meaning? Yes, it's clear-cut meaning. Then you're told by Allah, humble yourself to that. Humble yourself to that. Fair enough? Humble yourself to that. May Allah grant us Jannah. Why? Your intellect, the source of knowledge, is from the creation. Revelation, the source of knowledge, is from the... Creator. So prefer the knowledge of the Creator over the knowledge of the creation. Do not wait for your intellect to make sense of something for you to say, then I will believe in the revelation. No, no, don't you ever do that. Are you guys with me? Now I'm saying this in the 21st century. I, is anyone here, anyone here will be surprised when you hear there's an open heart surgery? Your intellect, what does it tell you? It's possible. Then some of you are like, okay, then I see a revelation. It, it's possible. You see that? No. Because even if it doesn't make sense to you, 
You should still believe in it because the slogan of the of Muslims are this. Ready for the slogan? That's your slogan. If the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said something has happened, then it has happened. It's over. Fair enough. So back to the story. We established something very well, inshallah. So the Prophet gets the heart surgery. Brother, brother, really quick, if he can spend just a minute or two, please, on what? Remember, long time ago, the first session or so, and for those watching, it's session number two, inshallah, when the Prophet was a few, couple years old, and then they, two people came and put him on the floor, they cut his chest open. Remember when he was so young, before prophethood? And then the people took the heart from his body, these two people, they took something, a black dot from it, put the heart back and stitched it, remember? And the people said, oh, this guy is going crazy, remember? Yeah, what's up with that one? Now I can tell you. Now your iman, inshallah, can handle. That dot that the angel took from the heart of the prophet was the door for which the devil can whisper to the prophet. Are you guys with me? Was the door, was the access which the devil had to the prophet. So when the angel took that dot away, the devil no longer has access to the Prophet Are you guys with me? Fair enough? So this heart surgery, what about the other one? Such scholars, they say, to get him prepared for what's about to happen. Fair enough? Ceiling splits open, the chest splits open, heart is brought, washed with what? Faith and wisdom, put back, stitched back. Muhammad, what's going on? Let's, get, let's head out. Nighttime, the Prophet leaves, guess what he sees? Al-Buraq, an animal. Buraq, what is that? Between the size of a mule and the size of a donkey. Never seen in this world before. Fair enough? The Prophet was about to ride on it. Al-Buraq reacted to it. Al-Buraq reacted to it, why? Some said out of excitement, Muhammad is about to come. So Jibreel saw this as a disrespectful behavior. This is not justifiable excitement. He said, who is about to ride over you now is the most honorable human being that ever sat on you. So respect. So there was a saddle, reins on Al-Buraq. The Prophet rode in it. Who's with him? Jibreel. Where are we headed? Jerusalem. Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Allahu Akbar. Man, how long? Usually, usually, it takes the Arab a month, one-way trip. Mecca to Al-Quds. A month. And a month back. So it's a two-month round trip. So one way is how long? One month. How fast is Al-Buraq? How fast? The Prophet says, it places its next step where its eye can see. So whatever the eye can see, that's my next step. That's how fast it goes. So the Buraq made it so fast. Okay, should I talk the intellect of 1400 years ago or the intellect of today? Choose one. Today, okay, today. Is it a shock to make it to Jerusalem in an hour or a couple hours? Not, not much, right? You have a... Concord or whatever, F-16, you'll make it in no time, yes? So to us, like, we're all like, yeah, okay. People cry, he's like, what in the what? Are you crazy? You're going to watch what's going to happen afterwards. Watch when he comes back. Ready? So you see, you don't submit your intellect because, okay, the revelation kind of makes sense. No. If it didn't make sense to you today, it may make sense in a hundred years from today. Are you guys with me? So as Muslims, we submit now. May Allah grant us all submission to Allah. So the Prophet goes to Masjid Al-Aqsa. Once he gets there, he ties Al-Buraq. You know, parks the car, ties Al-Buraq. Ya Prophet of Allah, Buraq is gonna run away. <laughs> the Prophet, the Buraq came just for you. But this is the Prophet teaching you something. Yes, trust God, but you need to take the means, right? So he tied up the Buraq, and he head to the masjid. They went to the masjid, and the masjid was packed. It's not like what it is today. It was not under the Muslims' leadership, but the masjid was packed. Who was there? All the prophets. What? La, nah, brother, this is like, you just took us to a whole other level. Like, I know, being realistic. This, shuf, the trips the prophet took before, something to encourage you. This one is something to encourage him. Are you guys with me? So he went there. All the prophets. Not much discussion that we're aware of that took place. Not much. And he went. Who leads the prayers? If I come, but if you don't mind, what's your name? Ghamdan. Huh? Ghamdan. Ghamdan. So can I use it as an example? Mm -hmm. If I come to your house and Aisha comes in, who leads prayers? Do I lead or you lead? Who's supposed to lead? I am. He's supposed to lead. Ghamdan. But what if Brother Majid knows more 
perhaps he knows more. I'm just giving an example. What if I know more? No. Who leads? The, the one responsible of the house, yes? When the Prophet leads in the Masjid Al-Aqsa, when there's Prophet Solomon or Sulaiman, when there's Prophet Musa or Moses, then who is the one responsible for that Masjid today? The Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes? So the Prophet and Allah is teaching us something. Don't lose focus to that Masjid. Your affiliation to that masjid is not one associated to you being Palestini. It's not associated for you that you speak Arabic. It's not associated because you are part of that culture and ethnicity. You're associated because of your own religiosity. Are you guys with me? The highest level of bond. The one that will never be broken, inshallah, the bond of faith and religion. May Allah grant us understanding of the deen. And when he left the prayers, Jibreel alayhi salam, he offered him two things. He offered him alcohol. The brother, astaghfirullah Alcohol was not prohibited at that time yet. And he offered him milk. He said, choose whatever you would like. The Prophet ﷺ chose milk. Then Jibreel says, you are guided to the pure innate nature. Jibreel teaches us something. Your default status, your default settings in your body is that you're a pure human being. You're not a filthy person. No, you're not. You're a pure human being. You're someone who came from a man whom Allah created with his own hands. Are you guys with me? You're a pure person. Khalas, we're all pure. But yes, we can get polluted because of the actions that we do. May Allah protect us. Maybe a lot of sins and bacteria. What? The way alcohol is formed. Yes or no? Alcohol that makes people intoxicated. Like sins. May Allah grant us wisdom. Amin Rabbil Alameen. So don't, whenever you feel yourself, there's filth in your life, which is possible. You can go back to purity. Just go back to default settings. May Allah grant you all Jannah. Say Ameen. So this happens. Then Jibril says, it's time. It's time to go where? It's time to go up. It's time to go meet Allah. It's time to go up in the heavens. What happens? They go and they ascend all the way to the first sky. Ha now, now, 2019 people, you're like, I'm struggling. <laughs> the heart, the heart, open heart surgery, I got this. Traveling so fast, I got this. Going all the way up, you want to ask, like, how far up? Right? Is it to the moon? I got this. No, further. Like, Mars? Further. Ah, uh, what do you do with the intellect? Khalas. Your science, your books, your teacher says, this is the furthest we go. Revelation says, no, a human being can go further. Allah says a human being can go further. You know why? Because the question is not who went up. The question is how did he go up? Are you guys with me? If someone is carrying a newborn and goes up to the 10th floor, will you ask, how did the newborn make it to the 10th floor? No, you don't ask that. You ask who went, took him to the 10th floor. So you're surprised. Now, how did the Muhammad like how did he go there? No, ask who took him up there. Are you guys with me? Completely two different questions. Now you go to a very high-end, new-built skyscraper, 100 floors in a matter of seconds, yes or no? So don't think it's too difficult on Allah. Brothers and sisters, if you want to travel, for example, Detroit to New York, how? Jogging. Okay, the only way you can do that if you want to get married. That's the only way possible. It makes sense. May Allah grant us all Jannah. Say, I mean, it will take you a long time, yes? Put more energy. Give me an, and something with more energy. What if you have a bike? You'll cut it shorter, yes or no? What if you have more energy? What, what do you mean? You're given more energy. You have a car. Now you're talking about hours, no longer months, no longer weeks, no longer days. Now actually maybe a day or so, or hours. Okay, what if you say you have a helicopter? Oh, now you're like going over the water, right? What if you have an airplane, hour and a half, max, two hours, you're in New York. What if the one putting the energy is Allah? When Allah puts the energy, there's no time. When Allah puts energy, there's no time. Halas? Humble? Down, degrees in the drawers, inshallah. Halas, just for this session. PhD, Zakallah Khair, you worked hard in the drawer. Barakallah Fiqh, in the drawer. Allah? Actually, you can, you can take it off, just look at it and, and then put it back. Allah? Okay, it's okay, it's humble, humble. You can benefit from your degree, of course, right? And appreciate greatness, because you saw greatness as a doctorate. Wonderful. He goes up all the way to the first sky. Just goes through like that. No, gotta knock on the door. There's a gatekeeper, knocks on the door, Jibreel. He says, Who's this? It's Jibreel. He says, Who's with you? Muhammad. Has he been permitted to come up? Yes. He says, Ahlan wa marhaban. Welcome, what a great visit this is. The Prophet is looking 
and he sees a man looking to his right, looking to his left. People are here and people are here, many people. When he looks to his right, he cries. When he looks to his left, sorry, when he looks to his right, he smiles. When he looks to his left, he cries. Jibreel tells Muhammad Sallallahu this is your father, Adam alayhi salam, Prophet Adam. So then he says, Salam alayhi, go say salam to him. So the Prophet comes and says, Assalamu alaikum. Then Adam alayhi salam responds, and may peace of Allah be upon you, O righteous son. I'm so proud to have a son like you. Adam, the father of all of humanity. Then he made dua for his son, Allahu Akbar. May Allah make our parents make dua for us and not against us. <laughs> I mean, okay? He made dua for his son. Then Jibreel told the Prophet, you see the people to his right? Yeah. These are his children, the progeny and progeny in which will end up in heaven. He looks at them, he smiles. The ones on the left are from his children. He looks at them, he cries. Something we'll learn from Adam and his mercy, alayhi salam. He does not mock them. He feels bad for them. When he sees someone on the complete bad track as a true believer, just like our father Adam, he feels bad for them. Are you guys with me? He cried. He hoped that they will be on the right side. Prophet Muhammad sallam, goes up again. He goes up to the second heaven. Knocks on the door, the same process. Who is it? It's Jibreel. Not me, me, open. <laughs> he mentions his name. Are you guys with me? This is from the etiquette Jibreel teaches you. Hey, open. Who is it? It's me, bro. Me. Who's me? Right? You, me. No, who, who is it? It's Jibreel. Who is with you? Muhammad sallam. Has he been permitted to come in? Yes. Okay. Ahlan wa marhaban. Welcome. They go up. It's Prophet Isa, Jesus, and who is with him as well? Prophet Yahya. So he looks at them. Jibreel says, this is Jesus, this is Yahya. Isa and Yahya. And they were cousins. So go salam, say salam. Salamu alaykum. They said, wa alaykum as salam, or righteous brother, righteous prophet. And they prayed for him. Fair enough? Then he went up to the third sky. Same discussion. Who's in third sky? Let's do a quiz. Brothers, brothers. Who's in the third sky? Brothers. Musa. Musa. Close, sisters. Alhamdulillah, we're even. <laughs> Prophet Yusuf, alayhi salam. So he goes up to the third heaven. And then, the whole knocking on the gate, we got that. Let's move on, inshallah. We got that. I'm not disrespecting the hadith. La, la, I'm not disrespecting the hadith. I'm just summarizing the whole seerah with you. Are you guys with me? No disrespect. So then, he goes to the third heaven. Jibreel says, that's Yusuf, alayhi salam. Prophet, some call him Joseph in English, right? So then, Salim alayhi. So he says, Salam. The Prophet, he says something about him. He is gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. He says, Utiya shitr al jamal. He was given half of beauty. Brothers and sisters, if Prophet Yusuf was given half of beauty, Muhammad was given the whole entire beauty. Amin Rabbil Alameen. If you don't like it, you don't like it. But this is, if you don't make sense to you, but see, Allah, it's okay. No one is better than Rasulullah. Sallam. No, no. No. You know some ulama, they say, feel free to disagree, respect, I respect you, okay? But no bias, yeah. The Prophet, when he said half of beauty, the scholars they mention, Yusuf is so gorgeous, he has half the beauty of the Prophet, Move on, yeah, big, big, big stuff. May Allah protect us. <laughs> All right? He goes to the fourth sky. Okay, now start with the sisters. Fourth sky, who's there? Which Prophet? Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Ibrahim? Okay, sisters. Ibrahim. Oh, brothers. Uh, Musa. Musa. Okay. Says, sister says, Prophet Idris salam. I tried to search in English. It's not 100% accurate, but I heard, I heard some say it's Enoch. I know we call it Idris. Okay? Prophet Idris salam. Jibreel says, this is Prophet Idris. Says, salam. Salam alaikum, Prophet Idris. He says, wa alaikum as salam. Oh, your righteous brother. And he prays for him. He goes to the fifth sky. Fifth sky, really quick, brothers. Ismail, close, close. Maryam. Nuh, khalas. Prophet Harun, alayhi salam. Prophet Aaron, in English, right? So he goes to Prophet Harun, this is your brother, Prophet Harun, salam, alaykum salam. May God praise for him. Then he goes to the sixth heaven. I got you, Prophet Musa, right? All right, you can say Musa, Musa. Right? He goes to Prophet Musa, alayhi salam. And each one, each one is, is a is a call to you and I. What? Each one is a call to you and I to learn about their lives. Are you guys with me? It's a whole lecture on its own. Each one deserves a lecture or a series on its own. 
May Allah grant us to be able to see them all in Jannah. Say Ameen. Amen. Then the Prophet ﷺ sees Musa, greets them, then he goes to the seventh heaven and he sees a man leaning, leaning on a Bayt al Ma'mur, like a Kaaba. Al Bayt al Ma'mur, its meaning is the frequent, the the frequently visited place or house. What Al Bayt al Ma'mur is to the heavens is what the Kaaba is to us. Yani if the skies were to open, Al Bayt al Ma'mur would to fall, it would fall right on the Kaaba. Are you guys with me? And the Prophet sees seventy thousand angels go around that Bayt al Ma'mur in the seventh heaven. And they go and they never come back again. And a whole new 70,000 show up every single time. And then Jibreel says, this is Ibrahim. So the Prophet goes to him, says salam. And Ibrahim says, welcome, O oh, my righteous son. Because he's from the progeny of Ibrahim, alayhi salam. And he prayed for him. And look what he says. Muhammad, tell your followers. You guys ready? Ready? Tell your followers, assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar. We say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim. So we pray for you, Ibrahim. We respond back every prayer. Rest. And he says, tell your people. It's like a, he's like a grandpa, right? Tell your people, Jannah's awesome. It's worth waiting for. Allahu Akbar. He says that the dirt of Jannah is amazing. The dirt and the water. Azba, beautiful, pure. And tell them, do you want to plant Jannah? You guys want to plant Jannah? Say, Subhanallah. Go. Wallahi, if we were sincere and Allah accepted, a tree has been planted. Ah, huh, sisters, brothers. How do you like to decorate your interior decorators coming? Say, Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. La ilaha illallah. Wallahu Akbar. Ah, four trees. When I get there, 50 50, inshallah. Allah? May Allah grant us Jannah. And bi idhnillah, wallahi, we say it and we smile. But wallahi, I do not think it's impossible in Allah that you and I go to Jannah, see the four trees. Remember, it was November 8, 2019, like Subhanallah. So say Subhanallah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. La ilaha illallah. Wallah, I'm about to just quit and just do dhikr, okay? <laughs> it's all together, inshallah. And then khalas, right? But we gotta work, we gotta work. So as he reaches that point, he goes all the way to the end of the seventh heaven. Sidratil Muntaha. And that's the peak, that's the ending. And he sees the ending of a massive tree, huge tree. The leaves of the tree are like the ears of an elephant. And the Prophet says, and to me personally, it's one of the greatest examples of the greatness of Jannah. Ready for this? This is just an example of what's in the heavens. He says, I cannot describe its colors. Like how can you not describe a color? It's close to red, it's close to green. Yeah, he's like, it's outside the spectrum. Wallah, that drives you crazy. Revelation intellect. Right? Oh, you who's in art did four years. Good luck. <laughs> May Allah grant you Jannah. He says, and what's amazing about these trees, each fruit is like a huge, huge, huge piece of like a jug or a container. One fruit. And he says what's so amazing is that the colors of it are not static. They change. <laughs> Just different colors. Now, he's like, yeah, we see different colors changing, right? You go see a billboard, blue, then the next one comes, right? But talk about Jannah. Then the Prophet is called, brothers and sisters, focus with me. May Allah grant you Jannah. Say, I mean, Then the Prophet ascended to go meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. The greatest meeting of all meetings. No meeting is beyond that. May Allah allow us to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a lot that took place. A lot that took place. I will share with you. Five things Allah told the Prophet. Sounds good? Five things. And you all have to agree with me. The fact that Allah brought Muhammad about to tell him something, these five things are a real big deal. Yes or no? Everything was Jibreel, Jibreel tell Muhammad. Jibreel, Jibreel tell Muhammad. Jibreel go tell this Muhammad, yes? But now you go up. I gotta tell you something, one on one. Five things. What are they? After the break, inshallah.